This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 64. So about a week into my residency, starting again as an intern in pathology, I realized that pathology wasn't for me. It's not that it's a, a bad profession or there's, there's negative things about it. It's just people talk about finding their calling in life. And I don't know how that goes for other people, but for me, this was my, my moment. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds, our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. Hey everyone, welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. It's exciting to be here with you this week. I feel like there's so much I want to just tell you and share with you. I've been working on the loneliness workbook for you guys, and it's coming together so well. I'm hoping to have it out by the end of this month, but bear with me. It might be the beginning of February. I want it to be really useful for you and to look great too. So that's been a lot of fun. And like I said, hopefully something actually useful coming your way soon. I also wanted to remind you about the White Coat Investor course. If anyone is interested in that, it's a finance course. You can buy that through my website. I find it to be very informational. I'm working on a full review of the course, working my way through the course. It's definitely got a lot of stuff in it, and I feel like it's a good buy for this reason. If you were to go and get financial advice from any financial advisor and you were to just pay an hourly rate, it's probably going to cost you a couple hundred bucks an hour. For two to three hours of advice, you can get many more hours of information in this course. And then if you still want to use a financial advisor, you'll know better what you want to actually spend your time discussing with that financial advisor. So I highly recommend the course. You can find the link through my website and I would appreciate the support that way. Okay, so today's episode is going to be special because I actually interviewed my husband. What a good sport. You know, I have to really give a shout out to this guy. He lets me talk about our family on the podcast and has encouraged me to do so. In fact, when I first started brainstorming the podcast, I considered using a pen name to protect our privacy. And he encouraged me to just keep it real. And I think that has made a big difference in my connection with you is keeping the podcast as real as possible, sharing true stories, you know, and just there's nothing fake about it. I mean, this is us. This is our life. You know, what you see is what you get. What you hear is really us. So with all that in mind, he's going to share a bit of what he went through as he went on a path to to choosing general surgery as a career choice and kind of how he came about to that decision and some of the struggles that he had along the way. So I hope that you'll enjoy this episode of us talking and well, I guess that's it. Enjoy. Hey, Josh McKeldry. Thank you for joining me today on the Married to Doctors podcast. Hi, Laura McKeldry. (laughs) Glad to be part of your show. (laughs) I'm so glad you're finally on. We've been talking about doing a show together for a long time. I've done really well at procrastinating this. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's kind of hard. You know, I know when I started the show, there was even some talk about doing this anonymously because, I don't know, like we we considered, you know, do we really want an invasion to our privacy? Do we want to tell people all about us? And it was a hard decision, but I don't think I could connect with my audience without being honest and, and open. Okay, so you're ready to air our dirty laundry to the world? (laughs) Well, I don't know. I don't know. So having you on, it's like next level, right? So yeah, I feel like the audience kind of does know you a little bit just because I talk about, you know, you and us and our marriage and the kiddos. But I've had a few friends at work say, I probably know more about you than you think (laughs) or or than you want to know. (laughs) It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. But um, I guess this is your chance to introduce yourself to my audience. What do you think is important for them to know about you? 
Uh, you know, I mean, in the past two decades have all been about, you know, building, you know, this career. And, and it, you know, my name is Josh McKeldrew. I grew up in Little Rock. I did undergrad in Fayetteville, Arkansas at the University of Arkansas and med school in Little Rock at UAMS. Um, after that, residency has been interesting, as I think you've shared bits and pieces of, and maybe we can talk a little more about more about that today. But uh, started out in general surgery at uh, Riverside Methodist Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, did that for two years, then did a stint in pathology um, back in Little Rock, and then um, finished surgical training at the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin. Um, was in practice for a couple of years, and then went and did my surgical critical care fellowship at the University of New Mexico. And now I'm in practice in uh, Springfield, Missouri. So do you look back and have a time in this training that was the most challenging? The most challenging. I mean, there's challenges every step of the way. And and to say, you know, which one was the most or the worst, I don't know. Uh, I, I think, you know, internship is is a natural place to point to as, as being difficult. Being at a new hospital, being most junior and least familiar with, the pathology that you're coming across, at least familiar with how to function, you know, in that particular hospital and make things happen. It was a stressful time. And, and, and so I would have to point to that as, as one of the most difficult times, mm-hmm. which is, I, I think, typical. Yeah, I definitely mm-hmm. think internship year is, is a hard year for, for many, maybe even more so for general surgeons. I don't know. Is that fair to say? I, I think everyone that goes into their internship feels lost and, <laughs> and they're struggling. I say that's pretty typical for for what I what I've seen mm-hmm. over the years. So let's back up just a little bit. We'll get into to your specialty choice and all of that. But I want to talk a little bit about our years during medical school. You know, unlike a lot of your peers, we had children. Do you think that was advantage, disadvantage, indifferent? Like for anyone listening that's thinking, oh, you know, we'd kind of like to start a family, but you know, maybe we should wait till we're done with medical school. What would you say about that? What was your experience of having kids during during medical school? I think as a general rule, anytime you have children, your discretionary time uh, takes a hit um, because you, in order to you know successfully care for them, you have to give them that time. And so was I a little bit covetous of, of how, you know, my colleagues had, you know, a little more free time for you know, more, you know, personal activities or selfish activities. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But, uh, I I wouldn't necessarily, you know, trade that, trade those things for the joy that I had, you know, raising my kids. Um, it was more difficult. You know, I had to, you know, for me, I had to focus a little more and, and, and be more dedicated, but I wouldn't trade it. Yeah. We had Ivan. Was that first or second year? So that was, that was the first year. Yeah. Because I remember I, I came home from the gross anatomy lab and you had been having contractions all afternoon and we called the midwife and she came over and we had a baby that evening. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's crazy, right? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, that was in the middle of anatomy finals, yeah. I think. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I remember you studying and I'm like standing behind you going, no, this this one hurts. Yeah. This one hurts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had babies and then we had an interesting experience third year when Ivan, the same little one burn first year, he had a brain tumor, which, you know, we had been watching him and had seen his regression, but it took some time to get him correctly diagnosed. We went in, had the MRI and then didn't leave the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. That was... I mean, for, for any parent that, that has a, a diagnosis like that, it blindsides you. And uh, I was grateful that uh, I was wrapping up my internal medicine clerkship and I was able to contact the clerkship director and they were like, take whatever time you need. And uh, it was during that, that final week that Ivan had his operation and then he, uh, he was recovering and, and I you know, stepped out to take the final you know, for the clerkship and then, you know, went back to the hospital and, and, you know, spent time and, you know, helped 
through the recovery process. And then the pediatric rotation started next. That was um, interesting because Ivan was in the the hospital where all, all my clerkships were. So uh, I would sleep in his room, you know, at night and, and you would go home and, and spend time with our other two kids. And then you would uh, get Orlando off to his preschool and, and Ammon to a friend's house. And then you would come up and relieve me. And, and then I would go downstairs and go to my clerkship. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That's so wild. But what I didn't remember was that you actually had a final the same week as, as Ivan's surgery. Like that's out of my head completely. I didn't even remember that one. So we were under so much stress. I don't know how you pulled off passing any any classes at that time because he had the operation and then he spent several weeks in recovery. It was one of these things where they said, oh, you know, he'll probably be home next week. And it ended up being several weeks. And You know, in, in, in hindsight, as as a surgeon, you know, I, I deal with, you know, operations and the surgery itself, you're done. All right. But the overall recovery of the patient requires often rehabilitation and things like that. And, and sometimes it's, it's not safe for them to go home yet. They need more, more uh, intensive therapy. And, and that's kind of the boat that we found ourselves in, you know, he had recovered from his operation fine, but he needed, you know, well, yeah, more, I mean, more he therapy. Could, he couldn't sit up, he couldn't walk, yeah. he couldn't feed himself. And, you know, he was two and a half. These are things that he'd been doing. Yeah. And so that was really tough. And I remember one day I was up at the hospital with him and you know, anyone that spent time at a children's hospital, there's usually those red wagons that you pull kids around and, and I was pulling him around and, and your whole class like came around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> that was during orientation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I remember this because, you know, I'm there being oriented and we walk up onto this, to this floor and there's you, my wife with my son, who's not doing well. He's just crying. And, and the class just kind of politely, you know, is passing by and I'm at the end of the line. So I stop and, you know, start giving Ivan some attention. And, and, uh, some of my classmates were like, just thought I had this, you know, great heart and was you know, ultra loving. And I think I am, you know, kind and loving, but, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't stop because I just, you know, you know, had this magnanimous heart. He, he was my son. <laughs> and so the, the clerkship director kind of said, why don't you stay and, and, you know, you don't need to continue on with the rest of orientation. And so, yeah. so that was, that, that was a rough day, um, for, for Ivan. And, uh, I'm glad I was able to bow out of some of my responsibilities that day. Yeah. He was still in a lot of pain and, and struggling to do things. And, you know, as a two year old, how much can he advocate for himself? So that's a little bit of a rough go. So we had that and we kind of got through that, I guess, you know, whew, made it through, but it was, it was all such a blur because we had all these things going on. And then I remember that you were doing rotations and you were trying to decide what type of physician you wanted to be. Do you feel like you were immediately attracted to surgery or did it take you some time to figure out that you wanted to, to be a surgeon? I didn't have much prior experience in, in the variety of the medical specialties. No one in my family was a physician, you know, prior to, you know, any experience in the hospital, you know, I worked in a lumber yard driving a forklift and did con construction work. And so, so I, I was pretty, you know, naive to, to the goings on inside a hospital and, and what different types of physicians did. So all through training, it was like, oh, wow, look at this, you know, isn't this interesting. And, and so it was it, quite naturally every clerkship I was on was, was uh, appealing, or I, I at least needed to go through the motions of, of, of trying it on, you know, what would life look like if I were to become a family physician, a neurologist, an obstetrician, you know, whatever the, the clerkship was. And so I think that's, a, that's a natural thing. Um, I, I did quickly gravitate towards things that were, you know, surgical in nature. You know, I, I was used to work with my hands and, and think, I think I had an aptitude for that. And, and so I quickly, you know, gravitated towards, you know, those specialties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you liking a lot of your rotations and me just kind of wondering, like, I wonder what Josh is going to choose. I wonder what he's going to choose. And it was, it was exciting and it was interesting, but I have to say that I didn't want you to choose surgery. And this is something you, you know, I mean, this isn't the first time we've talked about this, what? but <laughs> 
did you never tell me? <laughs> yeah, I really thought you had this strong interest in pathology too. And you, you had interviewed in both of them. And I thought if I just back away and I'm not like the, you know, snotty wife bossing you around. He'll make the right decision. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You'll make the right decision. And and dang it, if if you didn't, you know, you ended up ranking surgery high. And I knew you loved surgery. I remember the night you got to do burns and you came home and you had been, you know, doing some of your first skin grafts. You were so excited and so happy. And I was like, dang it, he loves it. And so I knew that you loved it, but I also knew you loved us. And I guess I just felt like surely he won't choose surgery. It's going to take more time. And it's just, it has this horrible reputation for being hard on families, but you chose surgery. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. All through the, the third year, I, I gravitated towards, you know, anything operative. And, uh, and then during fourth year, they, you know, people gave me counsel about what rotations to go through. Um, you have, uh, the ability to select, uh, electives and, uh, they say, do something you'll never do again. And I thought as a, as a surgeon, it would be beneficial if I had exposure to pathology. And so I, I did a pathology rotation and I, I fell in love with it. I thought it was amazing and really, really neat and interesting. And that thought that to be a surgeon is to put work before family. Uh, that, that issue, that, that concept, that thought weighed heavy on me. And it really made me consider pathology intensely. In fact, that I, I interviewed in it and struggled on which one to, to rank first. Yeah, and you, you ranked surgery higher and you matched. You matched in, in your higher choice. And we went, we moved to Ohio and, and started down this surgery path. And it was hard, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Residency was difficult. The first two years was I, I was gone a lot. And when I was home, I was home, but not there. I was tired. I was exhausted. I was on the floor asleep. And if I was up, I was a zombie or, you know, reading, trying to prepare for the next day. So that that was very difficult, difficult on me and, and very difficult on the family in general. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple of things made it perhaps even harder and these are common to a lot of families that go into a surgery specialty you know you move for the match that's pretty common yep. so we're in a new place we're further from home it's colder up there <laughs> which was personally hard on me wimp i am kind of a wimp <laughs> that's fine i don't like being cold it's no secret so I, I i didn't care for the weather it was also really hard that i had three young kiddos and like the oldest was just doing half day kindergarten. So I didn't have a break from the kids. Like they were with me all day and they were at that age where they needed entertained. You know, they needed me to take them and do things with them. They, you know, at home it was watch TV or something like that. You know, otherwise they needed to, they weren't quite old enough to play and entertain themselves very well. And so they needed a lot of like mom planned, mom driven activities and it was exhausting. Fortunately, Columbus offers a lot for families, and I do think it's a great place to live. But at the same time, it was still hard for me to pull that off as a single mom and trying to find anyone who wanted to be friends with this mom with three young boys that were rambunctious and only, you know, one of which was potty trained. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and besides all of that, like Ivan was still in his helmet when we first moved there. And I got anxiety. For the first time really in my life at that point, I just really, you know, struggled seeing him still wobbling around. And I was always, you know, half afraid he was going to get hurt. And I think looking back on that, you know, maybe I was a little dramatic. But in that moment, like, I just I was feeling the stress from all sides. You know, I, I think it ironic that Ivan is one of our most acrobatic children turning backflips, you know, off of, you know, any structure you can come across and jumping on the trampoline. I think it, you know, ironic that, you know, he was very unstable for a few years of his life and 
<laughs> he's very, very active. He's very, very active, but he still can't do a balance beam. Yet he can turn backflips. But he can do backflips <laughs> and, you know, have a lot of fun. And, and yeah. he's very active. He likes to play soccer with his friends and, and sports and, and stuff. So that that's all good. And I'm glad he's doing well. But, you know, at this point in our marriage, well, what, what would you say? Where do you think our marriage was at during those first few years of surgery residency? Tension. It was under tension. I remember trying to plan a date. You know, I was going to be home. I was going to be home. And I showed up in time for you to take the babysitter home. Mm. I remember that happening one time and just how frustrating that was. I I remember I was, you know, I was feeling stressed too. Um, I remember being on a date and, uh, you know, just the, the pager fatigue. I remember we were at some restaurant and every time the cashier would, you know, ring up another person, I would hear the the beeps and the bells from, from the register. And I was feeling a little jumpy, you know, from all that. Do you think the jumpiness was you being tired or do you think the jumpiness was you like just stress? Well, all that goes together. That's all in one package. Mm -hmm. I I mean, part of stress is, is, is the fatigue of, of, of being sleep deprived and things like that. You know, it's, it all goes together when, you know, one big ball of wax. So we're painting kind of a bleak picture here, you know, (laughs) how do people get through surgery residency? I mean, I have heard some people say that they intentionally don't choose surgery because they have a family. Do you think that's fair obviously it's gonna be different for everyone but, oh, like, but what so are if your you have a family you shouldn't do it or if you care about your family you shouldn't do it right i mean obviously like you would never choose surgery if you had a family right i mean that's kind of <laughs> kind of and 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 in all fairness there are some spouses that say maybe they they kind of put the law down a little bit and say you know no don't do it <laughs> you know um i i think it'd be foolhardy for anybody whether they have a family or not to think that that any surgical training won't require a little more sacrifice, I, I I think that's that's just a reality. And for each individual family to to take that into consideration, um, I think it's important to to go into you know this training with your with your eyes wide open and recognize that this is going to be potentially a little more onerous than either of us want, and. I guess you have to figure out, you know, what that good cause is that that keeps you going during the hard times, because I think it is worthwhile. I think it is a good specialty. I think it was, you know, hard for, for us to, you know, swallow that, that, that whole sacrifice up front because it is not easy, but, uh, it didn't mean that it wasn't the right thing. I think it was worthwhile for us to, to explore it and grow into it. And we, we took our time, right? Growing into it and exploring. Like, well, we took a break. <laughs> we took we a took break. And <laughs> a second year, I think we were, we were both ready for a break. And I was surprised when you said, I think I can be happy doing something else. And man, if my ears didn't perk up then, I was like, do what? <laughs> what? Are you teasing me? I, I think after, after two years of bearing that, that burden we had considered other things and i mean the the question is is real and and we had to face it would we be happier if i was doing something else mm-hmm. and that had kind of cycled through my mind enough through all the stresses that it, it was a it was a reasonable question it was a viable question that i couldn't say no to yet Yeah. And it's so interesting because once we started exploring it, things really fell into place and you were able to get a pathology position back in Little Rock. Like they remembered you and they were like, oh yeah, come on down. We happen to have a spot and we'd love to have you. And, and to me, it was like, man, all my prayers are being answered. Like everything's just happening. I got a teaching job. We bought our first house. We moved down there and we're like, let's go. We have this elusive work-life balance for the first time. The kids were all a year older or a couple years older. So they're all in, in school. The youngest was able to even get into a a great little preschool setup. Like I had it, I had a plan, right? (laughs) Things were better. We were back in a town that, that we knew we were close to family. So yeah. 
Yeah, and I think we could have just lived happily ever after. But, uh... So... <laughs> but then what? So, about a week into my residency, starting again as an intern in pathology, I realized that pathology wasn't for me. Yeah, it's not that it's a, a bad profession or there's, there's negative things about it. It's just people talk about finding their calling in life. And I don't know how that goes for other people, but for me... This was this was my my moment where I realized that I think that I have an aptitude, a talent, or whatever for for working with people who are sick or injured or or whatever the case. And I think I was missing that in pathology. You deal with whatever the surgeon gives you of the patient, and you try and give them an explanation of what you see and in a diagnosis um, whenever possible. And you don't interact with you know, the people. And I felt I was missing my calling. And, and so I, I went to my program director and I, I told him, you know, I, I think I need to be a surgeon. I know I, I left a residency spot and I had some regrets and, and he counseled me that this was common. You know, um, he himself had, had left, uh, uh, OBGYN and, uh, uh, practice and, uh, and he kind of felt the same thing when he left to go to pathology, but, but he assured me that, this was natural and, and it would pass. And so, and so I told him I'd give him a year. I'd give him a year and I'd be the best pathology resident that uh, he ever had. And I think I was true to that. And I worked hard. And it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun in pathology. I was with a really good group of residents and, and uh, we had a blast. But a year later, I was in his office saying, I'm looking for uh, an open PGY3 spot in surgery. And on my end of things, this was hard to swallow. I, it's it's interesting when I reflect back on it because when you chose surgery the first time, I think I was kind of surprised that you did. And I thought it was exciting that you wanted to be a surgeon and it was kind of neat. But honestly, I just wish you would have chosen something easier. So then when you did go into pathology... I don't know. I felt like we had arrived and things were going to settle down and, and you were going to kind of be this family man that I, that I, I wanted in the marriage. And then (laughs) you're kidding me. Like now you're going back into surgery. But for me, in a lot of ways, it was easier to accept the second time because at that point I finally had the, the belief that you should be a surgeon. And I had seen you try to the point of moving our family across the country, taking a job, try to do something else. And I was like, yeah, you know, this isn't about, you know, him not wanting time with us, but it is truly part of his identity or who he should be. You know, he needs to, he needs to be a surgeon. He needs to operate. And it gave me an easier it was easier for me. So then when we went back into surgery and you worked a lot of hours, it's not that I enjoyed that. Um, in fact, it was quite difficult because we'd had another baby. That's another story. <laughs> like they keep having these babies. <laughs> and it I was don't like, know how that happened. <laughs> it's like baby number four is there. So when we went back into surgery, like all of a sudden we had baby number four, who when we were pregnant with him, I thought like life was on on the up and up, you know, and then it turned around that we were going back into surgery. And so the the planning there was, was tricky, but I didn't have the same types of feelings that I had had the first time. So the first time in surgery residency, whenever you would be working crazy hours, it would often cross my mind, you know, he could have chosen something else. And the second time that didn't come up anymore for me. You know, things that might've come up for me might've been, they need to have more surgery residents. (laughs) You know, uh, there should be more people taking call. There should be, you know, more help at the hospital if they're this overworked. But it didn't cross my mind like that you shouldn't be a surgeon because by that point, I think we'd both kind of had that conviction that that's part of your identity and who you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my advice to to medical families that are considering difficult specialties, if, if you think they sh- could have chosen something else, maybe give them the benefit of the doubt. You don't have to move cross country to figure that out. You know, 
maybe just accept it a little sooner than I did? Well, make your own decisions. We made ours. Um, I, I know it's, you know, you, you see other people. I see other physicians and how they kind of went straight through it and, you know, med school, residency work. Great. Yeah, they're but, retiring and we're just not getting a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> they're like retiring at 40. We're it's, like, it's, hey, that's when we got to pay. Oh, it's oh, not that bad. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was in an interview for fellowship, you know, someone kind of asked and it kind of smarted, smarted a little bit, you know, like what's wrong? Couldn't, couldn't decide. And it's, it's not so much couldn't decide, but I was willing to try something else for the sake of you and the children, for the sake of our family. You know, this is, this is a a career choice that's going to last for decades, hopefully. And, uh, it was important enough to me to try. And, And for me, that meant giving up a categorical position that, you know, people struggle to get a guaranteed spot to train in surgery. And I had one, but, uh, you know, I walked away from it, even though I was there in good standing and that wasn't easy, but, uh, I think it, it helped us in the long run. Yeah. So you don't regret it. Do you ever think, dang it, we should have just stuck it out in Ohio. We could have been done a lot sooner. Oh, oh, those thoughts come. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone plays the what if game uh, with with their decisions. But um, I think we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace and not beat ourselves up about, you know, past decisions and mistakes. And and also uh, realize that we live life, you know, prospectively, you know, moving forward as opposed to, you know, living life looking back. You know, we, we, we can't make decisions based on what we can do and then, then look back at. And, and realizing that if we were to go back to whatever that situation was, in good faith, we made the decision based on what we had. Mm-hmm. And so we would probably make the same decision in the same situation with the same information. So, yeah, I would probably do exactly the same thing because I was trying to do the best that I could with the information that I had. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, man, it's been a long road. <laughs> And we haven't even told most of our story, but our episode's already getting long. I wanted to ask you, though, you work with med students now and they come through. What kind of advice do you give medical students that are trying to decide on specialty choice? The advice that I give them, you know, I remember being there and trying to figure out, you know, where I fitted in. And everything is 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 appealing and interesting. Uh, one thing that I try and point out to them is, Every specialty has something onerous about it, something that's not fun or, or not cool. And unfortunately, those day in, day out bits of drudgery are the things that make work not fun. And so I encourage them to, to find those things and figure out what they're willing to deal with and uh, encourage them to make a decision, um, not solely based on that, but strongly considering, you know, that these are the day in day out problems that I'm going to have to deal with and let that weigh into their, their decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So basically think about not just what you like about each specialty, but kind of what you like least about each specialty. Yeah. Cause that's, what's going to burn you. You know, that's, that's what's going to give you the burnout, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the onerous things. And if you realize those and, and learn to accept them, then it should be easier to enjoy your work. Well, I think that's good advice, and I appreciate you being on my show. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be fun to have you come back, and maybe we can tell some of the rest of the story. Or I feel like there's so many different questions I could ask you. But one final question that I ask most of my guests is what medical advice, or medical advice, what <laughs> marriage advice, we're not, we're not a medical podcast. Take two of these and call me in the morning. <laughs> What marriage advice would you want to leave with the listeners? And maybe particularly if you could talk to the families that are in high demand specialties and in the training years, what's the advice that you would want to, you know, maybe uplift them with or encourage them with? Marriage, managing a household, uh, managing a family is, is a team sport and teams only work when, when there's unity. As you come across, you know, whatever struggle, you know, you're dealing with that day in your home, in your family, in your relationship, 
I would uh, encourage you to work towards that unity and realize that whatever stance you have, there are valid points to. But at the same time, whatever stance they have, your spouse or, or a significant other, they have validity as well. And so working together, you know, through uh, compromise, through sacrifice or, or whatever's necessary at that time, building towards unity is the key to finding happiness in your home. Yeah, I like that. I like the idea of unity because I know I've said before that you can be on an amazing vacation, you know, in this beautiful tropical location. But if you're not getting along with your partner, it's kind of miserable. And at the same time, I think you can be in kind of a miserable, (laughs) surgical, difficult rotation and be okay. Be content because you don't have hard feelings towards your spouse. I think if you can get rid of hard feelings and feel united, then you can be okay despite the circumstances. I don't know how good we're doing, how well we do at it, but we try. Well, we have good days and we have bad days. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we're still trying. I think we've gotten better at um, kind of telling each other what we need to less mind reading. I need a shoulder massage. Can you help me out with that? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, hey, thanks for being a guest and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at marriedtodoctors.com.